Let's say that you just ate a big slice of pizza with onions, mushrooms, bell peppers, and jalapenos. To pull energy out of the glucose in that pizza, or really any food, requires glycolysis. Glycolysis is a series of enzymatic reactions in which glucose, a six-carbon sugar molecule, is broken down into two three-carbon pyruvate molecules. And as glucose gets processed, energy is produced in the form of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. Now, glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of cells, and no special organelles or even oxygen are needed to turn glucose into ATP. Therefore, all cells can use glucose to make energy, and it's possible to do glycolysis even when oxygen levels are low. Glycolysis can be divided into two phases an energy-consuming phase, and an energy-producing phase. It's like a business investment. The cell needs to spend some energy before it can start making energy. And like any good investment, the cell gets more energy back than it puts in. The energy-consuming phase requires ATP, and the energy-producing phase generates ATP, as well as other molecules like reduced nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NADH, which can be used to make ATP. We can keep track of all of this using an energy counter. Now, going back to that delicious pizza, first glucose from those ingredients has to get from the small intestine into the bloodstream. In response to high blood glucose, the pancreatic beta cells secrete insulin. Now, to get inside the cells, glucose utilizes glucose transporters, or GLUT, which are on the cell membrane. In fact, some glucose transporters, like glucose transporter 2 in the liver and pancreatic beta cells, are particularly responsive to glucose in the presence of insulin. Once glucose gets inside the cell, it's prevented from diffusing across the cell membrane back into the circulation by enzymes called kinases, which phosphorylate the glucose. Adding a phosphate group changes the shape of the glucose molecule which means that it can't easily diffuse out of the cell. Kind of like a criminal that's been handcuffed to the table in the interrogation room. That added phosphate comes from the breakdown of ATP into ADP and phosphate. So this initial phosphorylation step drops us to minus one on the energy counter. Specifically, there are two enzymes called hexokinase and glucokinase and they both add a phosphate group to the 6th carbon in the glucose molecule, turning it into glucose 6-phosphate. Both enzymes pretty much do the same thing, but hexokinase is found in all cells, whereas glucokinase, like glucose transporter 2, is induced by the presence of insulin, and is found in the liver cells and the beta cells of the pancreas. This first step is irreversible, meaning that the reaction can only go in the glucose to glucose 6-phosphate direction, and not vice versa. Glucose 6-phosphate is then converted to its isomer, fructose 6-phosphate, by an enzyme called phosphoglucoisomerase. So at this point, it's still a 6-carbon molecule. Fructose 6-phosphate is then phosphorylated by the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1, or PFK1 which adds a phosphate group to the first carbon on the fructose molecule, making fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is the second irreversible reaction in glycolysis, and it also uses ATP as a phosphate source. So now we're at minus 2 on the energy counter. This reaction is considered the rate-limiting step of glycolysis, meaning that the speed at which PFK1 converts fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate determines the speed at which all of glycolysis happens. In other words, it's the rate-limiting step of glycolysis. It's kind of like an assembly line in a factory. If the slowest step is putting tires on a car, then that's the step that determines how many cars get built in a day. Because of this, cells closely regulate PFK1 activity by using another enzyme called phosphofructokinase 2, or PFK2. PFK2 can also phosphorylate fructose 6-phosphate, but it adds phosphate to the second carbon instead, making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. PFK2 activity varies depending on the level of glucose in the blood. When the body is well-fed, 
like right after eating that slice of pizza, blood glucose levels go up and the pancreas secretes insulin, which activates PFK2 and results in more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Here's the key to all this though. Increased levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate activates PFK1, which means it increases the rate of available PFK1 enzymes. So more PFK1 means that the slowest step in glycolysis speeds up, and more glucose is turned into energy. More tires means more cars. Now, when the body is in a fasting state, like a few hours after a meal, blood glucose levels go back down, and the pancreas secretes glucagon instead of insulin. Glucagon inhibits PFK2, resulting in less fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which inhibits PFK1, decreasing the rate of PFK1 enzymes, and that slows down glycolysis. Fewer tires, fewer cars. PFK1 is also inhibited in other ways. For example, when cells are in high energy states, there's a ton of ATP floating around as well as citrate, because that's a byproduct of fatty acid synthesis. Both ATP and citrate inhibit PFK1, because the cells have lots of energy and don't need to generate even more. Now, when cells do need energy, PFK1 becomes very active in generating fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is cleaved by the enzyme aldolase into two 3-carbon molecules, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P, and dihydroacetone phosphate, or DHAP. Only G3P can go down the glycolysis pathway, so an isomerase enzyme converts DHAP into G3P. As a result, for each glucose molecule, there are two G3P molecules. Each G3P is converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, or 1,3-BPG, by an enzyme called G3P dehydrogenase. G3P dehydrogenase has two roles. It removes a hydrogen from G3P and gives it to a nearby NAD plus molecule, making NADH as a byproduct. It also adds a phosphate group to the first carbon of G3P, making 1,3-BPG. Now, since there are two G3P molecules, this happens twice, resulting in two NADH molecules. Each NADH molecule enters the electron transport chain in the mitochondria and goes on to make roughly three ATP each. Now, an enzyme called phosphoglycerate kinase removes a phosphate from the first carbon of 1,3-BPG and gives it to ADP, making 3-phosphoglycerate and ATP as a byproduct. So we'll add two more ATPs to our counter because this reaction happens twice. So now we're back at zero. Next, an enzyme called a mutase moves the phosphate on 3-phosphoglycerate to the second carbon, making 2-phosphoglycerate. After that, an enzyme called enolase removes a water molecule from 2-phosphoglycerate and makes phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. Finally, the enzyme pyruvate kinase transfers a phosphate from PEP to ADP, making pyruvate and ATP as a byproduct. This is our third and last irreversible reaction of glycolysis, and again we'll add two ATPs to our counter because this reaction happens twice. As it turns out, pyruvate kinase is also regulated by the cell. Interestingly, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate upregulates pyruvate kinase a process called feed-forward regulation, because it's kind of like one enzyme priming another one because it's clear that things are about to get busy. On the other hand, high levels of ATP and the amino acid alanine downregulate pyruvate kinase activity. Alanine comes from skeletal muscle breakdown when fasting, and it's used as a substrate for making new glucose. So high levels of alanine signify that the body needs to make new glucose not break it down in glycolysis. Once pyruvate is made, glycolysis is pretty much over. Until this point, the process has worked without the need of oxygen, so glycolysis is considered anaerobic. And to this point, we've generated a total of two ATPs in the process. So although this is a good investment, it's not a great investment. Fortunately though, most cells have mitochondria and have access to oxygen because that's where the payoff really becomes obvious. 
That's because pyruvate can enter the mitochondria and participate in the Krebs cycle, also called the citric acid cycle, as well as the electron transport chain, all to make more ATP. And in the end, after all the mitochondrial reactions, you'll end up with a net total of roughly 30 to 32 ATPs. Now, some cells don't have access to sufficient oxygen, like an exercising skeletal muscle cell or a red blood cell that lacks mitochondria. In those situations, the cell can use the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase to remove hydrogen from an NADH molecule and give it to pyruvate, making lactate and NAD plus as a byproduct. NAD plus is crucial because it's needed to work with G3P dehydrogenase and keep glycolysis going. Now, normally lactate is removed from our blood by the kidneys. But if local lactate levels rise too quickly, it can sometimes build up. And this is what's responsible for some of the muscle soreness you develop when you exercise. Alright, as a quick recap. Glycolysis breaks down a 6-carbon glucose molecule into two 3-carbon pyruvate molecules, without the use of any organelles or oxygen. Overall, there's a net production of two ATP and two NADH molecules, which in the mitochondria make roughly three ATPs per NADH.